Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. Special guest Jonathan Platt is with us here, General Manager, A List Media. Uh, welcome back, Jonathan. Um, we were going through your, uh, you, I mean, you're working for Madonna on Truth or Dare. You're working uh, Pee Wee Herman, um, the Ed Sullivan Show. Next, you went on to Princess Royalties and Alan Marilyn Bergman Publishing. That was with the same so, company, actually. Oh, the same company? Okay. Yeah. Um, but that was also where I started learning about royalties. And and Prince was really interesting because he had so many, um, he had so many AKAs because he wrote under so many different names. So uh, tracking. I heard that about him. Really, really interesting. You know, he's and, just constantly writing. I wrote right? for, the guy wrote for everyone. It was Everybody amazing. gave away music. It was just unbelievable. But in uh, Alan Marilyn Bergman, man, they did all the Streisand songs. They were one of the, the, the greatest uh, writers of all time. So I got to kind of learn a, about publishing, working through them. And so that was really important to me because, again, going back to my original, um, when I originally was talking to you about B.B. King, first thing you said to learn about publishing. So I got a really good uh, education doing that. Was that advice now looking back on that from B.B. King? Was that good advice? Did it was you great agree advice. with his? Yeah, it, it was really one me. Yeah, it was really opened up my eyes to a whole industry. Now, is this where you started um, dipping your toe in soundtracks and and music supervision at, at this time? In your career, is a lot different than music supervision. You know, music supervisor is the one who actually picks and puts music into movies or TV, and they go by the scenes and they work with the directors and they work with the producers and everything else. They're kind of an, an ambassador in a way. You know, part negotiator, part ambassador, and this and that. And then there's people who actually have to go in and clear it and then go and negotiate it with the publishers and with the record labels and this and stuff. Now, a lot of times you have to do both. But in the, in the first case, when I was working at Media Rights, we were just doing strictly the clearance side of it. But I really got interested into, wow, these music supervisors, what they do. And then it was my next job, which was I worked for an uh, amazing composer, one of the most amazing composers, uh, Christopher Frankie from Tangerine Dream. And if you know Tangerine Dream, you know that they did all the music for uh, Thief and they did um, uh, Risky Business. And Christopher himself did a bunch of TV shows like Babylon 5 and Walker, Texas Ranger. And so um, I was working in business affairs for them. So when I moved off from media rights, I went, moved into business affairs for a record, his record label, which is Sonic Images. And also... So that label both had soundtracks and also uh, I also was working in his film and music side. So I got to work with, and I was brought in by a, a, one of my closest friends from high school, uh, Brad Pressman. And so Brad and I got, we you know, got to work together and for her good three, four years, just really, uh, really got to work in the independent record label business, which was a lot of fun and working for an amazing composer. And so, uh, but we got to do everything from, new age to new uh new age to world to soundtracks you know so we got to work in all different types of areas and all types of uh of music okay and at this point did you did you feel like you were success i mean it, by the the artists and the the various companies that you're working for it sounds like you were but did you realize that or were you still like you're yearning for more you're, you're there's something missing you want you you want to go to the next ring so to speak. I never really thought about it at that point. That's not, wasn't really, uh, I was happy that I was in this industry, right? But I still had to fight my own way into it. We were very mm -hmm. independent. You know, we had distribution that was through major distribution, but we were always, always independent. Um, I was still learning. I'm still, you know, I was still pretty young at the time. I was still in my early 20s, mid 20s. So we're still learning our way, but we got to do a lot of really cool things. Now, what is that a the 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 path that you had taken at this so far? Was that like a was that the natural progression for what you wanted to do at that point, or were you like you said you you couldn't you, you had so many interests, so you were were you jumping? I mean, what how does how would you normally you know chart your path, or or was it you were know, you following interests more than like a career path? I had a, a great opportunity to work with a really close friend of mine and also to learn from one of the most amazing uh, composers and artists and with Christopher. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a few great years, but then at that time, 
uh, we were working on a um, on a we were doing a, a show called Raven with Jeffrey Meek it was on CBS, and I Jeff said you got to really meet my vocal coach because uh, because I was like uh, I'm like um, like okay, so I met his vocal coach. His, his vocal coach said, you know, I have this client of mine. He's Japanese and he really needs some advice. Can you um, can you meet with him? And his name is Daisuke Hinata. And I said, sure, why not? Yeah, I just never know where everything is going to go. I always want to take a meeting if it makes sense, you know? So I, I go and have dinner with this guy. And I, I I kid you not, over the dinner, I decided to leave my career, take a lot less money. And he offered me a partnership to work with, with him to start a, a potentially a record label and this and we don't know where it was going to go but it was working in japan and working this and i've always had an always had a love for interest in japan so because my dad used to sell electronics and used to go to japan for the most of my 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 childhood so i've always had this interest of japan for whatever reason and so we started uh we started a label together called hyperdisc and lo and behold within a few months we ended up um we, he ended up getting a composing gig on a TV drama called Long Vacation. Uh, this TV drama was became, and from that, I was able to negotiate a soundtrack deal with EMI, with a label deal with EMI, because they really wanted the soundtrack. And I got in the middle of the whole thing, and I ended up negotiating this crazy deal with EMI. It was like a four-year deal where they funded the label for four years. Um at that time, it was 51% owned by Toshiba. The other part was owned by EMI. On the Toshiba side, they actually funded us. And we had a record label. Um, in that record label, we also had a record store uh, because I grew up in the record store business with my family. And, and my partner, uh, Daisuke at the time, loves records. And as, as long as they're going to, as long as we're going to be able to cover it through the label and through the deal, we're going to go and do it. So we ended up having a record label, record store. That record store was a record store, coffee house. Um, it had a live stage, a live, live, live space, like a live stage space, and it had an art gallery all in one place in Santa Monica on Main Street. Uh, and, uh, Were you living between Japan and Santa Monica? I never went, I never lived in Japan, but I would go oh, there four times, four or five times a year. And mm -hmm. uh, at that point, we had a label. The first release we had was the number one soundtrack in Japan history at that time for a TV drama called Long Vacation. Um, Great soundtrack. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. This is Cagnet Generation, which was a combination of the first two soundtracks that we did, which was Long Vacation and Love Generation. Um, both were huge success. And from there, we have because of that success, we were able to write our ticket for the label and we had, I, I think we had a, a roster of half Japanese, half uh, American. I had a staff in Japan here on four years uh, between the time I was 25 and 30, where I was running a, a, an international label. And at oh. one point, we were the third highest selling label for EMI in Japan. Oh, that's incredible. What was the difference between, so you'd always had a love for Japan when you went to Japan for the first time. Uh, was how was that, what was that first, experience like and what's the music trip, scene like at this my time first, my first trip i had to go to a wedding to uh uh to dice case brother's wedding and i was the only one american there and everybody thought i was like some big actor star so no one would talk to me and uh and then i had to go sing karaoke at this wedding and i'm a terrible singer uh it was like it was nuts it was like going and seeing Rapongi for the first time and seeing uh Shinjuku and, and Shibuya and all the crazy lights and all the I mean it was it was it was amazing. I mean I've been there you know 30 plus times over the years, 35 40 times over the year. So over the last, you know, 30 years. So what was the, the really music like places. like at that time that the music scene. Well, we had J-pop. It was a lot of girl pop bands, mm -hmm. uh boy boy bands. Um it was very pop oriented bubblegum kind of thing, pop oriented, dance oriented. You know, I also, you know, got, there was a lot of J-Rock at the time as well. And uh, how, when, when, you know, when an you album, chose... At the time, ahead, a CD sorry. sold here for about sixteen ninety nine. Same would sell there for almost $30. 
So there's a good markup there. There's a good okay. profit level for <laughs> you. Yeah. How did you choose the half you, the artists on the soundtrack, the half the Japanese artists, and then the American artists? Well, that, how did what? you when you were on a, a success, when you're on a successful TV series, everybody wants to work with you. So we ended up dealing with a lot of different management companies that had different pop artists that we were signing to the label, and we would put their singles out through the soundtrack and through that, and, and then uh, Daisuke would produce those artists. So it was more of a vehicle for him as a producer to produce different artists. Well, and you mentioned that that little coffee shop and record uh, oh, record shop. That, that's when I first met you. Do you, you remember this? You had an office in Santa Monica. You had it was like upstairs above our patio at the Enterprise that was Fish a Company. Bit later, but when I was there is when I used to go into Enterprise all the time, and I think you were working at Enterprise Fish there at that yes, new, I was. That restaurant. And I would go there all the time because it was right down the street. And then um, a few years later, I, I ended up moving uh, right behind Enterprise Fish, and where they owned the building. So we, uh, we had I had an office up there for about six, seven years. Okay, so we got to take another break, Jonathan. Uh, this is fascinating. We're 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 moving through your life a little bit with you, and and uh, it's now now we're kind of catching up to maybe where I met you for at first, somewhere around there, somewhere around those years. Um, I wanted to ask you though about the record store. Did you love being an owner of a record store and a coffee oh, shop? It like was that? a dream. It was an absolute dream. I mean, you know, we had this crazy idea because one of the groups that we had in the record uh, on the label was an English version of a Japanese group. We had we created a band that was in the studio called Cagnet, and we had them actually work at the store because we thought, oh, why don't we just have them work and then practice during the day and then you know have concerts, have shows at night. So it was like this utopian dream. It, they turned out to be the worst employees, to be honest with you. We ended up having to fire them <laughs> as, as employees, but it was an amazing opportunity. It was amazing four years. And I was, before I had kids, my wife and I would have art shows there. My brother, Mark, would uh, actually uh, promote all the con different bands and uh, all the different, we had live bands there all the time. So we became yeah, like ZJ's boarding house right next door. Right. We had ZJ boarding house next door. So we had like a little scene going on in the mid 90s, you know, where a lot of artists, a lot of a lot of independent artists would come in and perform and play and then sell their records at our store. That was a great Main Street, Santa Monica, is what we're referring to where Jonathan's uh, record store was and coffee shop. There's ZJ's boarding house, which is world famous for surfers. Uh, you know it down on Main Street. There's Shotzi's Wolfgang Pucks, I think one of his original first or yep. first restaurants or second restaurants. Um, you know, the circle bar, which is still there, just a, yep. just a dive bar that a lot of actors have worked in over the years. The galley, really cool. that, the old the galley. galley down there. I mean, oh, yeah, I forgot about the galley. There's just um, so many great iconic places. Chaya you know. Venice. It, we were uh, right across from the Victoria, which were in downstairs. Uh -huh. the, uh, they had the, the club and the bar, like a speakeasy, and down there. So it was just which, it was a time. It's still my favorite uh, at the Victoria on Sundays going to farmer's market. It's my favorite one in LA. You get all the, you know, people shucking oysters. And raise, my kids, and raise my kids going there every Sunday when I was living, you know, when, when I started having my young kids, you know, so, yep. What a cool time. All right. We're with Jonathan Platt. We're going to go uh, take a real quick break. We'll come right back and uh, we don't want you to go anywhere here. Um, Jonathan Platt, general manager, A-List Media. We'll be right back.